Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Well, Thank you. <laughs> Very rarely do I get an applause, so thank you so much for that. Um, it, it's my incredible pleasure to be with you all here today. Um, it's, it's exciting, the things that are happening here at UT Dallas, you know, and I, you know, I've been here at, for two years as the Assistant Dean at the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, but more importantly, I am a proud alum from this university. I graduated with a master's degree in 2006 from UT Dallas, and over the past 12 years, I have literally watched this campus transform physically right before my eyes. It was funny because when I came here to interview for the position that I'm in right now, I literally got lost on campus because buildings and, and roads and everything has just changed immensely. And it's exciting to be here in the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center talking with you all here today. And so what the first thing I wanna do today is tell you why I do what I do. There's two things that I'm incredibly passionate about and that is education and entrepreneurship. And it's exciting to be here today, and I actually feel lucky, um, given the educational background that, uh, that my father gave to me. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why I feel lucky is because my father uh, came from India uh, to the United States in the early 70s, um, and he came here without an education. Uh, he only had a sixth grade education, and it was interesting to see um, how he created his career. Because of his lack of education, he actually defaulted into entrepreneurship. And it was interesting because my dad, he came here, he came here with very little. Uh, he came here um, not knowing the language. Uh, it's actually funny, you know, when I asked my dad, I said, oh, you know, why, why, did you come to, uh, why did you come to Dallas, Texas? He says, you know, son, I actually, I actually wanted to go to Indiana at first. And I was like, Dad, why in the world did you want to go to Indiana? He was like, son, I don't know. I didn't speak English. I just looked at the map, and I saw India and Indiana, and they kind of looked the same. He was like, maybe there'll be lots of Indians in Indiana. Thank goodness he didn't go to Indiana. He came to Dallas because he had a friend here. And so, so it's very exciting to see how, how the impact that he was able to create, as well as the impact that, what small impact I've been able to create through my education, combined with entrepreneurship, I really feel and I really believe that some of the world's most pressing problems um, in society will be solved by an entrepreneur. And specifically that intersection where education and entrepreneurship meet. And so, you know, I like to describe myself as an entrepreneur. Um, I've had a company that I've sold. I've had multiple companies that have failed um, and failed miserably. I think that's part of being an entrepreneur. Um, I've started up in, uh, initiatives, like for example, the initiative that I'm starting up here at the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, a new initiative that's never been done in the 30-year history of the Johnson School. So I like to dis uh, describe myself as an entrepreneur disguised as an educator. And you know, whenever you hear the word entrepreneurship, and Brian and Angela will, will, will talk a little bit about this as well, whenever you hear the word entrepreneurship, people think owning your own business. And, and I think that's only one part of it, okay? I believe an entrepreneur um, exhibits traits that you see here up on the screen. I believe entrepreneurs um, are individuals that are passionate, that are visionaries, that are able to create uh, 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 solutions and be creative with solving problems. Um, I have here creative, and I don't mean you know art, you know uh, uh, painting a picture or sing, singing and dancing. But what I do mean is solving problems in a manner that no one has ever thought about. Um, I have here embracing failure. Uh, going down the entrepreneurial journey, many of you here today are entrepreneurs. And I bet you exhibit these traits either with the teams that you manage, the projects that you manage, uh, the companies that you work for. I believe you can be an entrepreneur without starting a business, okay? And, and so when you go down the entrepreneurial journey, um, you know, I've been here at UT Dallas for two years now in my current role, and we started things up that have never been done before. And some of those things failed miserably. And so one of the things, it's not a question of, 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 of if, it's a question of when uh, uh, you have a setback. 
And how do you handle that setback? How do you learn from it? How do you fail? Fail fast and fail forward. I believe that's what defines an entrepreneur. And so as, as I'm sitting here uh, and I'm thinking about the different hats that I have worn, whether it be a, as an investor, Brian and I and Angela have actually worked on many investment deals together where we have personally invested in various ventures. Uh, as an entrepreneur, um, uh, uh, building a company and selling that to a, for one to a private equity firm and one to a competitor. As an educator, uh, when I came out of college, I actually started off teaching fifth grade science over at the Hockaday School for Girls, all girls school, private school here in Dallas. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I learned a lot from that experience, being the only male teacher there for, for, for quite a while, which was interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then also as an educator, whether it be at SMU or here at UT Dallas, with all of those hats that I've worn, it's been interesting to see a common thread. And I bet some of you have also seen this common thread um, in terms of how do you go about executing on something that you're passionate about, okay? My two passions, very clear, education and entrepreneurship and the intersection of where they meet, okay? That's something that I believe is going to impact the world. And how are we going to do that? Well, without, with wearing all of those different hats, um, I've really seen uh, three different areas become a trend. Um, setting a vision, creating partnerships, and leveraging social capital. And what I mean by social capital, well, with social capital I define is the goodwill that each and one of you have via the relationships that you've either created within your organizations or externally with partners, okay? And so when, when I'm sitting on, with my investor hat on, I start to ask the entrepreneur, uh, what's your vision? What are your partnerships that you've created? How are you leveraging your relationships? And the other day when I'm sitting with my team here at UT Dallas, we asked the same question. So I started to see these three trends with managing groups, with managing people, and with creating the vision that you want to see within your organizations or within your world. Um, so one of the things that I will talk about a little bit is um, uh, my role with the Blackstone Launchpad. And so Brian and I and Angela, we've had a working relationship for the past five years. And it was interesting because um, before I started at UT Dallas, um, I was actually, I started up with a group of individuals, a global consulting firm. That worked in um, countries like China, bringing capital into the United States for venture capital deals, for real estate deals. So I have, a, I have an interesting background. I'm an educator, I've taught in fifth grade and, and I have a master's in education, but then I have this weird background of MBA with finance and deals and all the rest. And so I kind of go between those two and, and really marry entrepreneurship and education in that intersection. And so I do this program through the Bush and Clinton Foundation, so it's called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. And through a connection uh, to UT Dallas, the former executive director of the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, an individual by the name of Jeremy Vickers, Jeremy calls me up and goes, Chris, you, ha you have a weird background. You're an educator, you're an entrepreneur. Come over here and help us with this project. And I said, okay, well, what is this project? And he said, um, Blackstone's interested in uh, coming to Dallas, coming to Texas, actually. Started off with Texas. Um, and I said, okay, well, what, was, what is the vision for, uh, for what we're trying to create? And we sat down over a cup of coffee at a Starbucks, and we articulated what that vision was going to be, which is building a sustainable ecosystem for entrepreneurship in DFW. So DFW is a few decades behind uh, cities like Silicon Valley, um, uh, Bay Area, I should say, uh, Boston, as well as New York. And I said to Jeremy, I said, well, how are we going to do this? And he said, well, if you look at the data, let's go through a feasibility and see, um, and see if Dallas uh, could pan out in terms of building that startup ecosystem for entrepreneurs to go out and change the world, to do things that we feel passionate about, and to solve some of the most pressing issues in our society. And so we looked at the research, and we came up with four different um, uh, pillars, I should say, that makes a community startup friendly. And the first is, the first couple are, 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 are obvious ones, right? You need a community with a lot of capital. Okay, if you look at DFW, DFW is ranked third in concentration of wealth in the United States. You need smart people 
or entrepreneurs, right? People who are going to be out there thinking about creative ways to solve some of the issues that we all uh, uh, think should be solved in society or create better processes through management and whatnot, through technologies and all the rest, which Brian will talk about. And DFW has a number of incubators and accelerators from the deck to Capital Factory that just moved here. And Brian's going to go through this in, in incredible detail. Um, local industry support. So Texas is ranked number two, and many of you probably know this, in terms of number of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and of, uh, uh, in Texas, uh, of that number, which is 54, DFW uh, has the most in terms of concentration. We just overtook Houston um, uh, last year. And so DFW has an incredible connection to industry, and that is really important as we look at the companies like AT&T and, and Toyota, who just in the past year and a half have both announced venture capital funds, AT&T for IoT, a, a, and um, Toyota for AI, uh, investing heavily in those two areas of focus, which is exciting. And then number four is key, right? So those, those three cities that I, that I, uh, that I described to you, uh, the Bay Area, Boston, and New York, all of them have a university anchor that supports the startup ecosystem for that city. And so our vision was to basically pitch Blackstone in terms of why they should invest in DFW uh, with the data that I just described to you. And if you look at it, um, liberal arts education is great, but really the focus of these cities are tier one research institutions that have a emphasis on innovation. And so we looked at that from a uh, university anchor perspective. When you look at the Bay Area, you have Berkeley and Stanford. When you look at Boston, Harvard, MIT, and et al., a number of other uh, universities. New York, you have NYU and Columbia that are very, very um, present in the startup ecosystem in DFW. And so we were able to make that, that case uh, for Blackstone, and we were really excited because at first they were going to only give it to one university in, in the state of Texas. But when they really boiled it down to it, they, they looked at three different markets, the Houston market, uh, the Austin market, and DFW. And so they gave it to three universities all at once, and it was announced here, and it was really exciting. Uh, uh, Brian will talk more about that when they announced uh, Blackstone here at UT Dallas. But one of the key things, and this is one of my firm beliefs, so we got the grant, and we were wondering, uh, what do we do now? And I'm sitting there with Jeremy once the grant was, uh, was given to us or, or promised to us at the time. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm saying to Jeremy, um, who are we going to get run, to run Blackstone? Um, and Jeremy said, you know, it's interesting. Um, here's the traits of what traditionally um, we, you know, we, we were going for. Um, individuals with a research focus and entrepreneurship, um, incredible knowledge of venture capital, and, and PhD preferred. Kind of a traditional leader. And it was interesting, the debate that we had, because we, we both understood, and I firmly believe this, that your people, the people that you manage, the people that you deal with day in and out, internally with your organizations and externally, are your most important asset. I mean, bottom line, I mean, individuals ask, what, what is your competitive advantage? And people always say the technology and this and that. I firmly believe in all of my hats that I've worn, it's your people. And so we knew this was going to be an incredibly strategic hire. So lo and behold, Brian and I are, are, are having a glass of wine one day. And I, I say to him, I say, you know what? This would be an incredible opportunity um, to come in and to do something that you are very passionate about. And we were very excited that, uh, that, that it took six months, but uh, that he said, yes, we're going we're gonna to come and we're going to do this together. And it's exciting to be working here uh, with a friend um, and, and colleague. And so getting back to that research institution, uh, innovation and, and whatnot, connecting um, what Blackstone's doing to the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science is incredibly important. And so I'm going to give you a little overview. I'm going to go quickly over this um, of the Johnson School. You know, the Johnson School is one of the most rigorous programs, academic programs in the United States, engineering and computer science. Um, when you think of entrepreneurship, you, you don't necessarily think of entrepreneurship being in a school of engineering and computer science, and we're starting to see a trend. We're starting to see a trend with our students, the technologists, that are wanting to get out there and start their own companies. And so we knew that we had to create a partnership with Blackstone, and we had to set that vision, 
create that partnership, and then also leverage our relationships and our social capital to make sure that, that we make it a reality. And so if you look at the research funding in the Johnson School, you see we have 53 million. We're the second largest school on campus. The School of Management is number one. Uh, however, we're the largest in terms of research funding at 53 million last year. And then over 30% of our students are international students. That's gonna be important as Angela talks about the th things that she's doing in China and how we were able to take a Blackstone to China and, and do some uh, partnerships uh, cross-border uh, with Angela's guidance. And so that's an important uh, statistic as well. One of the things that we're doing at the Johnson School is never been done before. I'm, I'm the first assistant dean in their uh, four corporate uh, development alumni relations in the history of the Johnson School. Um, and so this really has not been done before. So I'm creating this as I go along. And as you can see, I have my, a picture of my team, phenomenal team. I'm very blessed and, and, and honored to be working with each and every one of them. But the Johnson School, what, what is our vision? We, we have articulated that vision across the entire school. We want to be the most coveted place uh, to study, to research, and to teach in the entire Southwest. That's our goal. I believe Dallas needs that. I believe that makes impact for entrepreneurs, for society, for humanity, for kids who come here and study, for researchers who come here and do the, the amazing work for humanity that they're doing in their classrooms and labs. I believe that that's important, and, and, and that's why um, we do what we do, right? And so we're doing it with two areas of focus, excellence and innovation and teaching and research. So that's important too because that gets back to what Brian's gonna talk about in terms of the connection to Blackstone and all the rest. And number two focus, access. Access is key. You know, I had a chance to go to, a, you know, uh, went to SMU and UTD, but went, went there on scholarship. Um, and so, you know, otherwise without that scholarship, I would not have had access to go out and to do the things that I'm doing. And so that's very, very important. Priorities. Um, so you see some of the priorities, you know, to be coveted and to be the most, um, sought after place to do the work that you want to do, um, you need phenomenal facilities and phenomenal people, and that's what we're working on being competitive. Um, some of our partnerships, so I have a picture there of Mark Cuban, right, and so he was just on our campus um, a few months ago, um, but our first partnership through the Johnson School, through this initiative, was with the Blackstone Launchpad at UT Dallas, which Brian's going to talk about in more depth. Um, but then also, um, our second partnership was with the Dallas Mavericks, which we were really excited. Um, and when Mark came to us, he said, you know what, I know that UT Dallas has some of the smartest students, some of the smartest researchers, and what I'm looking to do is leverage your talent to analyze the data at the Dallas Mavericks to make sure that we can stay competitive in the future. Mark's all about technology and how he can use technology to make the Dallas Mavericks better so that we can win more championships and celebrate. And so he wants to use AI and big data to do that. And so he came to us and said, you know what? Here's what I'm looking to do and here's what I could do for you as well. And so really creating that partnership that, uh, that is duly beneficial for, for both organizations on campus in a big university like UT Dallas with 28,000 students, um, creating a partnership between uh, the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, the Jindal School of Management, and Blackstone Launchpad. That was uh, a, a feat in and of itself in terms of creating that cross-pollination that is what's in the best interest of our students to go out and change the world and do the amazing things that they're gonna be doing. So one of the programs in our, in our school is the UT Design Program, and we work with a number of corporate sponsors to do this program, to actually fund the projects. Um, and it takes faculty and staff alongside students and a corporate stakeholder, uh, an individual that, that is running a project from a company. And what, it, what they do is work together to solve a problem for the corporation. Well, so this program has been around in the university for about 10 years. It's a phenomenal program. Here are some of the companies that we've partnered with. You know, uh, most of the large companies and Fortune 500 companies here in the DFW area that have partnered with us for this program. But one of the things that I wanted to share with you, um, so Brian and I are, are sitting there and we're, we're talking about the amazing impact that UT Design can have for these companies. And one of the things we talked about was, you know, wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be impactful for this same opportunity that is afforded to these big companies, wouldn't it be interesting if we could provide that same level of support with our students and our talent within our university 
for the entrepreneur. And so we started thinking about, well, what do we want to see? What is our vision? And Brian and I, we sat there and we articulated a vision. And that vision, as you can see here, um, is looking for opportunities for engineering and computer science students to engage in hands-on entrepreneurial learning experiences. Okay, That was our vision. We wanted to make that a formalized program on campus, whereas before, in the 30-year history of the Johnson School, had never been done before. And so we talked about, OK, what, are, what does this partnership look like? OK, what is the needs of Blackstone? And what are the needs of the Johnson School? And how are we going to bring that together? And then, of course, we talked about you know, leveraging our social capital, right? You see two logos there, Plains Capital Bank and Nia Ventures, both which we have dear friends that work at. Um, and the founder of Nia Ventures basically said, you know what, we believe in what you're doing and created a partnership where now they can be involved. They're a venture capital fund. They're always looking for deals and innovation to invest in. And, and so by virtue of them helping us get this program off the ground, we're able to benefit their day-to-day -day business as well via the access to deal flow, innovation, as well as talent uh, for, their, uh, for, for their organization. And so again, vision, partnership, social capital the trend that you're starting to see throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. And then, one of the, exactly a year ago, Brian and I and Angela you know, had this great idea of, of, or complicated idea, I should say, of what can we do to take Blackstone to, to, to UT, uh, and UTD uh, to, uh, uh, to China? You know, if you look at the market, and Angela's going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the trend in venture capital in China, if you look at what's happening, it's not a question of, uh, you know, of when China, or excuse me, of if China happens to the United States, it's a question of when because of the incredible amount of innovation, capital, as well as um, uh, um, economic drive that that country is producing. It's just a question of, of when. Um, and so we need to be prepared and create those uh, uh, partnerships between UT Dallas and Blackstone. Remember I told you 30% of our students were international? Uh, well, many of them are, uh, are from China. Actually, Angela is a, uh, is a Jindal School alum. She got her MBA from the Jindal School and, uh, and is also head of the, the, the UT Dallas Chinese Alumni Association with, uh, and hosted Dean Perkul, the, the, the dean of our school, many times in China. And so one of our visions was to create um, a platform that can engage our alums and partners um, on the work that Blackstone's doing in this venture capital space. So we know we needed partners, and so we created an opportunity with these organizations um, for research and funding for one of our professors. And so in this picture, you see one of our professors. This is in uh, Shenzhen, actually, with our Chinese Alumni Association that Angela helped set up. And so Brian and I knew we need to figure out how to get into China. Actually, if you look at Blackstone and the mission of, of what Steve Schwartzman's doing, he's just created the Schwartzman Scholars, which is focused specifically on China uh, and learning China and learning the economy of China. And so he's betting big in country um, to learn. Um, and we looked at how can we create this partnership that would be duly beneficial to our alums and to our individuals in China, but then also to our, our, our faculty here. And so here you have Dr. Void, who is doing some incredible research with a company called Adaptive 3D, which is looking at new materials for insoles for shoes. Um, and he goes to China, and through the, the amazing work that Angela helped us with, um, was able to uh, create this partnership with a manufacturing partner as well as a venture capital firm that can invest in the amazing things that he's doing. He's essentially spinning off his research, and then that's really, really important as well. And leveraging our social capital. At the end, we see social capital, the relationships that we had beforehand. Brian, Angela, and I um, served on, on a committee for the US-China Investment Summit and, and helped create that, and that was really important in making this happen. And so. To end the presentation, you know, again, vision, partnerships, social capital, for me, have been the things that have, um, I've seen a trend. And I'm hoping that, you know, some of the things that you all can go back uh, to your organizations, go back to your teams, go back to your communities, um, you can go back with, um, you know, the questions of, you know, I have these questions from a vision statement, you know, what is your team's true north? You know, when you're running a project, you know, have you articulated, um, have you done an assessment on where everyone stands? I did this with my team here at UT Dallas after about six months of working with them. I asked them, I said, hey, everyone, can we articulate why we're here? What is our vision? 
and I have a team of six, and I got six different answers. And I realized, okay, even though I thought I knew where we were going, the individuals on my team, I had not, apparently I had not articulated it well enough. And so that I think is really, really important. Coordination, have you asked your team what's our vision, like I just said? Uh, and then consensus, have you built a critical mass of people within the organization that believe in your vision? Brian and I have to do that uh, uh, constantly amongst a large organization like UT Dallas, and that's one of the things that, uh, that I believe uh, should be done. So strategic partnerships. Sometimes strategic partnerships can look like this. When Brian and I went to China with Angela, uh, you know, we, we didn't know what was going on because we didn't speak the language, but it somewhat looked like this, chaos for us. It was so many, so many people and so much chaos, but we were able to figure out because of the things that Angela was able to guide us with. And so the four C's of what I call uh, uh, four C's to a good partnership. Complementarity, right? So do you complement each other? Um, sometimes resource differentials within a partnership is not a bad thing, right? So we talk about the, the example of Blackstone and the Johnson School. Blackstone being the new center that's doing all this thing in emerging technologies, AI, IoT, which falls right in our wheelhouse for our school. Um, but, uh, but being a new center with a school that is the second largest on campus, you know, we have, we have resources, we have talent, we have programs and all sorts of other things. But Blackstone being new, um, being nimble, uh, being agile, having a clean slate, was actually an incredible value. So just because the, the center was new and might not have been as big as the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science on campus, that doesn't mean that they didn't bring value, incredible value. And so sometimes resource differential does not equate to value differential. And that's sometimes when a partnership, you want to make sure and be very clear on that. Just because you're small doesn't mean you're not valuable. Okay? Congruence, understanding your partner's motivations and needs. We have to do that all the time. And that takes constant checking. And I, th I believe and I hope that with your teams and your organizations that you all are doing that and understand the motivation and needs. Going back to the Johnson School and the Dallas Maps, I had to understand for us to partner, what is your needs? What are you looking to do and how can we meet that need? But then also articulate what our needs are and what we're looking to do as well. Um, compatibility value aligned and shared vision. I use the example Brian, Angela, and I, you know, whether, regardless of what, what hat we wear, um, we have a shared vi vision, we have a shared trust. I believe whenever you manage a project with your people, having that shared trust is the foundation to everything. I mean, that, that's so key and so important because when you have that trust, you can go through something like this and, it, and your, your, your partnership or your project not fall apart. Right, you can go through the chaos because you understand where each other where each other lie. You understand what you all believe in, and you're all rowing in the same direction. Um, and then social capital. You know, I have the definition of social capital of being the goodwill that is afforded to people uh, and the power that social relationships build. And so, one of the things that I like to say is, um, you know, you have to find ways to give value. I believe building social capital is one of the most important things that. Um, um, you know, one of my business school professors used to always say, your network equals your net worth. And, and having that network and that, that trust within your organizations, but also with your partners, is very key. And you saw some examples of how we were able to leverage our social capital in order to advance the mission that we believe in. And then consistently articulating your values. I believe that's important. I would ask you, with the, with the groups that you work with, the companies that you're in, the projects that y'all are managing, how, do, do you, if you were to ask your team, what are my values? Would they be able to uh, articulate? Would they be able to recite that? Um, with my team, I've had to say it over and over and over, and I put it on our agendas. It's what is our values? We're here to make the Johnson School the most coveted place to teach, research, and study, and they know that, and we articulate that all the time because that's our true north. That's where we're going. Okay, with this partnership here, I get a chance to arrange these individuals and really, really work with them on a number of different things. Brian's the expert in venture capital, and you're going to hear from him here soon. Uh, Angela, when it comes to cross-border transactions. But, you know, we each have a statement of purpose, and I know both of their statements of purpose um, over the past year, five years of working with them in different roles. Um, mine. Mine is providing access to people through education and entrepreneurship. Very clear. Right, you know, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I believe is going to shape the world. That's what I believe is going to change the world and impact people. That's why I'm here with you today because I want to share that with you all. Uh, and so that everything that I do aligns with that. 
Brian's. Brian says this every, every uh, around uh, New Year's, Brian and I and Angela, we get together and we articulate our values for the, uh, for the year. What are we going to do to impact the world? What are we going to do to help each other and, and do the things that we feel so passionate about? Brian's is being competitive in the venture capital space and is helping as many entrepreneurs as he can. Right? He says that all the time, and I hear him say that all the time to his students, to the faculty, and to the individuals at large. And Angelus, Angelus is being the expert in cross-border business between US and China specifically, and servicing the foreign investor, an entrepreneur or partner. So when we took Blackstone to, to, to China, she was our expert that we relied on, and she did a great job doing that. And so I get a chance to have a lot of fun to work with these individuals, to see them succeed, um, and, and I just play a very, very small role in their success. And so uh, thank you for letting me share these words with you. I hope that it was valuable. I hope that you take these, these, uh, these um, uh, words back to your organizations and that it helps your team, it helps your organizations, and it helps make impact for the people that you all deal with. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Chambers, who will talk a little bit more on detail of venture capital. So. Yeah. Thanks, Chris.